I served as an officer in the Marine Corps from 2008 to 2017. During my second tour of Afghanistan, me and my unit was based in the south of the country, in a place called Helmand Province. A lot of what we were doing were mounted patrols, which involved our whole platoon piling into what we called MRAPs. MRAP stands for Mine Resistant Ambush Protected, and they're basically these big armored trucks that are supposed to be able to withstand explosions and whatnot. They worked pretty good for a while, but the Taliban had an easy workaround. To counter our bigger vehicles, they just started making bigger IEDs. For those of you that haven't seen The Hurt Locker or any movie like that, IED stands for Improvised Explosive Devices, and such weapons were the cornerstone of our enemy's arsenal in both Iraq and Afghanistan. The only thing was, it wasn't as simple as just making bigger IEDs, as the Taliban bomb makers only had a finite number of resources. Sure, they could put all their high explosive eggs into one basket, so to speak, but it meant they had less to spread out along our patrol routes. This was a big problem for the Taliban because if we uncovered their one or two big IEDs, we could guarantee ourselves at least a few days without having to worry about another one. The Taliban's secret weapon was their ability to place bombs in places we least expected it. They'd spent enough time fighting the Brits and the Danes to know what kind of clues we'd looked for, and they tried their darndest to subvert our expectations at every turn. But as a matter of fact, we had our own secret weapon one that the bulk of my platoon simply called The Kid. In reality, The Kid was probably older than most privates, and he just had this very unusual look to him. He wasn't very tall, so from a distance you could easily mistake him for a boy in his mid-teens. But then as he got closer, you realized from the patchy facial hair and crow's feet around his eyes that he had to be way, way older than his teens. That or he had the hardest paper route of any kid in history. In the end, we set his age anywhere between 18 and 34, and after a lot of arguing back and forth, we actually started placing casual bets on how old he was. Then get this, when we finally asked him, he told us that he didn't know when he was born. He only knew that he had been born sometime during Ramadan, and that he thought it was after the Soviets had pulled out, but couldn't be sure. Some of the junior guys in our platoon thought that was about the craziest thing they'd ever heard, and I get it, but not knowing your own birthday is a depressingly common thing in Afghanistan. They don't seem to mind much, and they go hard on the two Eids too, so Afghans aren't exactly stuck for things to celebrate. But anyway, first time we met him, about a week into the tour. He was working the fields near the compound he and his extended family lived in, and when we turned onto the dirt track that snaked through the fields, he came walking over to stare us down as we slowly and carefully approached him. I ordered our convoy to stop, as I wanted to respectfully introduce myself and my platoon. Not so much a tactical decision as a strategic one, as we were still very much back into the winning hearts and minds routine, and it never hurts to try and win a few friends among the locals you'd be seeing on the regular. Now bearing in mind that I'm extremely anxious about dismounting from a stationary convoy like that, because it made us a juicy target for an ambush. But I also figured that since the kid was so comfortable approaching us, that there was probably no Taliban in the area. So I walk up to him and gave him my friendliest salam alaikum before our platoon's translator took over. Through him, I very briefly explained who we were, what we planned on doing, and how long we'd be planning on doing it. I also told him, again through the translator, that if he and his family needed anything from us, that he shouldn't hesitate to approach her combat outpost, but only in the daytime, with nothing we might misconstrue as a weapon. The whole time, he just stared me down, looking at me like he wouldn't pee on me if I was on fire. And when I stepped forward to shake his hand, he offered me his left. This is a grave insult in a lot of Eastern cultures, and it all stems from their rather old-school bathroom habits. You see, with no toilet paper, you need a system. You eat with one hand, and wipe with the other. And guess which hand you wipe with based on which one the kid offered me. That's right, the left. And by offering me it, it literally was implying that I was a piece of crap. No, I was wise to this, and I'm not the kind to take stuff like that personally. So I just laughed it off and told him I was good for a handshake, because I knew what he was insinuating. After hearing my reply through the translator, the kid's face changed and he seemed stuck between being impressed and scared that I'd take his insult to heart. I told him he was fine, 
then offered him some powdered Gatorade as a kind of olive branch. He seemed to know exactly what it was, and taking it was the closest he came to cracking a smile. After that, we mounted up and carried on with our patrol. The next time we saw the kid was when one of our sentries spotted him walking towards our cop with what looked like a toddler in his arms. Through the translator, we worked out that the kid had some kind of stomach ache. But after our corpsman fixed up a cocktail of Gatorade and ground up Motrin, the little girl started to feel better and they went on their way. This little incident marked a turning point in our relationship with the kid and his family, and within a week or so, he had become our very own secret weapon. Every time we passed his compound, the kid would be waiting, having heard our engines from like half a mile away. He'd then run up to the convoy, said his salams, then would say something in Pashtu along the lines of, the area of Wazir Calais is very busy today, do not go there. And we quickly realized what he meant by busy, and although he'd never come out and say it, we knew he was referring to the locations of enemy IEPs. We went 36 days straight without a single IED strike, and it drove the Taliban crazy. We used to listen in on their ICOM chatter, and they'd be going nuts wondering if drones were constantly watching them. Their frustration meant they began leaning on small arms and RPG ambushes, but we were more than equipped to deal with straight-up firefights like that, and we inflicted some serious casualties over the 36-day period. And then the day came when we turned on the track that snaked through the kids' fields and spotted something in the dirt ahead of us. Obviously in a kind of foreign object in or at the side of a patrol route and we'll dismount to check the area for explosives. I was never in the point vehicle on any of these patrols, obviously due to the threat of IED strikes, so I asked our forwardmost MRAP to glass the object ahead of us just to give me an idea of what it was. I still remember what the Lance Corporal's voice sounded like when he gave me the reply. I remember how cramped and hot it got in those MRAPs, how I could taste the salty sweat on my top lip from how much fluid I was losing. The whole thing is like a full body memory. And all they said in reply was, it's the kid. I thought I'd been clear on the fact that whatever was on the track ahead of us was an object, not a person. So I asked the forward vehicle's commander to clarify. It's the kid, he said again. It's his head. The Taliban had somehow caught on to the fact that the kid was the source of our intel. I guess it was only a matter of time before they figured it out, given how many eyes and ears they have among the local populace. The only thing I can't work out is how they figured it was him. Combat operations permitting, we tried to stop and talk with as many locals as we could, and we were relatively cozy with most of the surrounding village elders by the end of our tour. It could have been anyone feeding us that intel, so how in God's name did they figure out that it was the kid? It's something I've never been able to figure out, and ruminating on it just makes the guilt eat away at me even harder. But, and... This next part is going to make me sound like a total jerk. It's not the kid's death that makes me feel guilty. I feel guilty because I know without his intel that dozens of my soldiers would have died on that tour. And in some twisted, messed up way, that makes him acceptable collateral damage. I hate that I think like that, but I do. Call it a coping mechanism. Call it the product of some latent PTSD. It just is what it is. The soldier in me says he died a good death. I just wish whatever's left of my humanity would believe it. Hi, let's read. David from Queensland here. Now recently I undertook a kind of personal project, one that involved recording some conversations with my 75-year-old father. Now he's been battling quite a serious illness recently, and I know he doesn't have much time left, so... I decided to sit down with him and ask him all the questions I'd never had the courage to ask in years gone by. We talked about a lot of different things, but I think the subject I wanted to explore the most was his time in the Australian Army. I knew that he'd served in some capacity during his life as my parents had mentioned it in passing when I was an ankle biter, but he never talked about it in any depth. He didn't display any medals or pictures, meaning I had no clue as to where or when he'd served. So it was only when we sat down to talk that I found out, after almost five decades of mere ignorance, that my father was a Vietnam veteran. That's also how I found out that 
The scars on both sides of his knee weren't from an old rugby injury. They were war wounds. He kept it such a closely guarded secret that even Mum didn't know that he'd fought in Vietnam. They met after his discharge and he never once mentioned the war, so she reckoned that he'd managed to stay home by working as a clerk or something like that. Neither of us knew a single thing about what he'd done over there, how long he'd spent deployed, nothing like that. So when he agreed to talk to me about it, I made sure to not press him and just waited until the actual recording session to ask my questions. It took me a while to get it done, but I used a combination of speech-to-text programs and manual editing to make a full transcript of our conversations. And this is an abridged section of our Vietnam conversation. That includes the story I think you'll be interested in. So, without me waffling on any further, here's the story of my dad's time in Vietnam. I chose a very poor time to join the army. The plan was, join the army as an engineer, serve for a few years, then use the money and skills I'd built up to open up an auto repair shop over in Rockhampton. I signed on for a six-year minimum contract, but then two years in, Australia got involved in Vietnam. We'd had advisors in before that, working to train up the South Vietnamese, but no one expected it to escalate in such a way. I certainly didn't anyway. And if it did, I thought being an engineer would keep me out of harm's way, for the most part at least. But oh how wrong I was. In late 1968, I was summoned to the office of my company commander and when I arrived in his office, he had a sheet of paper in front of him. He gave me a look over then asked me if I was indeed just 5 foot 5 inches tall and 70 kilos and I told him yes, that I'd always been short and skinny but that I'd passed all the relevant army tests as well as meeting all the minimum height and weight requirements. And that's what I thought it was about, you see. I'd gotten it into my head that they were trying to kick me out because of my smaller stature. It turns out that quite the opposite was true. The army wanted men of my size very badly indeed and that's because of a very special kind of job that only we could perform. A job that would earn us the name Tunnel Rats. Along with about a hundred other guys, I was sent back to the Army School of Military Engineering near Sydney, where we underwent a three-month crash course in what was called Tunnel Clearance. To counter the threat of air power, the Vietnamese communists had taken to living underground as means of avoiding detection. It was such an effective technique that our ground forces were forced to come up with a means of flushing them out. We tried everything. Grenades, dogs, tear gas. The Yanks even tried flooding them with water at one point, but the only thing we sent down those holes that was really effective were people. And to fit down there, you needed to be short and skinny, just like I was. We crawled through a few replica tunnels the instructors had built, but the meat and potatoes came down to the kind of combat we were told to expect. Most of the fighting in Vietnam was in really dense jungle, and from a lot of the stories I heard, you rarely got a look at the Viet Cong during a firefight. But in the case of us tunnel rats, we would be getting up close and personal with the enemy, so close you could touch them. In fact, more often than not, you had no choice but to lay hands on them, because the fighting down in those tunnels was quite literally hand to hand. You went down into the tunnels with a handgun, a flashlight, and a knife. Sometimes a rope to tug on if you needed help, but that's about it. You could use the handgun if you really needed to, but shooting in such a dark and enclosed space could really mess up your eyes and ears, so it was always a last resort kind of thing. The enemy tended to just flee if they knew we were in the tunnels, and we post blocking forces to try and cut off their escape. But every so often, you had to get your hands dirty. Ideally, you wanted to sneak up on a bloke, clamp your hand over his mouth, and stab the Jesus out of him before he knew what was happening. That way, you could either keep going, or go back to warn the rest of your mates without the enemy knowing you were there. But after a while, the enemy got wise to what we were doing, and they really wanted to take us out of the game. They started building booby traps into the walls of tunnels, mostly things like tripwire grenades, but... Some tunnels had false walls or floors where Viet could hide before plunging a bamboo spear into our bellies. There was even one instance where an American tunnel rat claimed to have found a booby trap consisting entirely of live snakes. The VC had dug out a little hole in the bottom of one tunnel, then tossed some highly venomous pit vipers. 
There was even a mouse or rat droppings dotting the little enclosure where the VC had clearly been feeding them rodents to keep them alive. They started doing a lot of that sort of thing after the tunnel clearance program really got going, just baiting us sometimes so they could kill our blokes. We heard that a Viet Cong got a big time reward for killing a tunnel rat and rightly so. It wasn't like you could train any soldier to do the job. The army only had a finite supply of smaller, skinnier blokes, and the more we lost, the more strain the job put on you. We were also faced with a massive problem when it came to taking casualties. 90% of the time, if the Viets got the better of a tunnel rat, he was a goner. But we couldn't just leave the bodies down there. We had to recover them. Same thing if a bloke was wounded, we had to send another man down there to drag them out. This was obviously very dangerous as the Viets were experts at setting traps and ambushes so try to rescue one guy and you might lose two or three other tunnel rats killed or wounded in the process. And that's how I ended up buying my ticket home. In June of 1969, me and another tunnel rat we called Sharky were flown from our base at Nui Dat to a place called Kawu Chai. We'd be joining the 5th Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment for what they were calling Operation Esso, which amounted to a month's worth of mine disposal and tunnel clearance in the area of Kawu Chui. We worked staggered shifts in teams of two, and that day was our day, so off we went. The moment we landed, some infantry sergeant runs up to the helicopter and tells us we're needed at a tunnel system about two kilometers from the landing zone. They'd been mapping out the tunnel system for weeks, making a note of all the entrances they could find. They weren't easy to locate either, being these small holes with wood panel covers that were very easily concealed. Anyway, they mapped out the tunnels, put a few blocking forces in place, and all we needed to do was flush out the Viet Cong so the other platoons could pick them off. When we arrived at the entrance the sergeant wanted us to start with, Sharky told me that he wanted to be the first one in so he could at least get a feel for the place before we both went down together, if it even came to that. He goes down, rope tied around the hand he's holding his pistol with, and says that he'll be back in a few minutes. But then a few minutes goes by and there's no sign of Sharky. As you can probably imagine, the rope that he held kept extending and extending as he moved forward. That way we knew everything was a okay Every so often, the rope would stop for a few seconds where Sharky was just waiting and listening or checking out his surroundings, I assume, but it'd always start up moving again in a moment or two. But then it stopped and didn't start moving again. Then after I gave the line a few tugs and Sharky didn't tug back, I really started to worry. I tried my best to wait a few minutes before heading down. I mean, I hadn't heard any gunshots or anything that might indicate he was in trouble. But him being so still for so long, it wasn't a good sign. So after a minute or so ticked by and there was still no movement, I got down into the tunnel myself to check on Sharky. Generally speaking, there were two kinds of tunnels here. The larger tunnels connected all the various underground facilities the Viet Cong had down there. They had field hospitals, armories, even bloody classrooms so their leaders could indoctrinate them with all that bloody Marxism stuff. But then, there were the smaller tunnels, the kind closer to the surface, where you literally had to crawl along on the belly to get anywhere. And it was this kind that I found myself in that morning. It was pitch black, and I didn't need to use my flashlight. All I had to do to find Sharky was follow the rope he was holding. So that's what I did. Move as quiet as a mouse, just hoping I wasn't about to crawl into a trap. Eventually, after a couple of minutes of crawling, I felt my hand touch the bottom of Sharky's boot. I stayed quiet as I gave it a nudge, but Sharky didn't move. He was dead, probably killed by some Viet who then ran off to warn his mates. And if that was the case, then job done. The blocking forces could do their thing. It just seemed unfair that the result came at the cost of my mate's life. To make sure that there was nothing restricting Sharky's body before I tried to pull it out, I switched on my flashlight to take a look around. The smaller tunnels were tiny, but it was just about enough room to lift your head up a little bit. That way I could use my flashlight to look ever so slightly over Sharky's body. But when I did, it resulted in the single most heart-stopping moment of terror I had ever experienced. I didn't get a good look at the bloke, I didn't have time really, but when I switched on my flashlight, 
There was this viet on the other side of Sharky's body, and he had a pistol aimed right at my flashlight. I ducked back down straight away, trying to get as low as possible. The guy must have shot at where the light was, and I know I must have blinded him a bit so his first few shots went over me. I know this because I felt the earth hitting the back of my neck from where the Viet's bullets were smashing into the tunnel ceiling. The noise was deafening, well and truly, and as much as I saw the flashes from where he kept on shooting at me, I didn't really hear the shots, not properly anyway. The only thing that kept his bullets from killing me was Sharky's body, and if he wasn't dead when I found him, he certainly was by the time it came to dragging him out. The guy shooting at me quickly extended his pistol clip, and he had to back out of the tunnel to rearm when I carried on dragging Sharky's body the opposite way. I could hear the bloke shouting for his friends in Vietnamese, and I knew it was only a matter of time before more bullets came flying in my direction. All I could do was focus on dragging Sharky, telling myself I still might be able to save his life if I just get him out of that bloody tunnel in time. I could hear the rest of my mates shouting on the surface. They'd heard the gunfire and were willing me to drag myself out of the tunnel in one piece. I almost made it out without a scratch, too. But as I reached the tunnel entrance and raised myself up to climb out, I heard another round of muffled gunfire before a bullet smashed into my left knee. I'd known blokes to get themselves shot, and because of all the adrenaline they didn't feel about a thing unless it broke a bone or something. But Jesus Christ, the pain I felt when my kneecap shattered in a dozen little pieces, it was like nothing I'd ever felt before or since. If it wasn't for the guys who grabbed me under the armpits and dragged me out of that hole, I might have lost one or both legs to a spray of Chinese-supplied bullets. Like I might have already said, that bullet wound was my ticket home. I was flown back, stitched up, put into a rehab program, then I was back on duty. Thankfully, I didn't have to go back overseas, but I did serve about 18 more months teaching tunnel rats how to do that job. And after that, I was out met your mother, and brought your ugly mug into the world. Snakes and ladders, eh, son? Now that's about as condensed as I can get it, and I hope it doesn't come across as a big wall of text, but I honestly feel like my dad has stories that many other people should hear, not just me. I know he probably won't be too happy about me sharing it with you, but I want people to know what an incredible man he is. Not because he served and fought in horrifying conditions, too, I might add, but because he came home, didn't grumble, and just got on with life. He worked hard, raised a family, and gave me and my sister every opportunity in life, and to me, that makes him a hero, even if it's only me who thinks so. I grew up during the 1960s in a fairly large North English town. It was a nice place to grow up, and I liked it very much, but when I turned 16, my mom and dad told me I needed to start paying rent. Luckily for me, my mom had already gone and sorted me out with a job. The only problem was, it was down at the local hairdressers. It wasn't a bad job. All I did was sweep up hair and I could have as many biscuits and cups of tea as I wanted. But unfortunately for me, being a boy and working in a lady's hairdressers meant that the other kids my age began to spread rumors about me. I'm almost certain you'll be able to guess what those rumors were, and for the most part, I didn't give a monkey's bottom what anyone thought about me. Only, I did care about one person who thought about me, and her name was Maureen. Maureen was the prettiest girl on my streets, and when I realized Maureen might think that I was batting for the other team, I just couldn't have that. So one day, as I was walking home from the hairdressers, I bumped into Maureen, who was on her way to the corner shop. She asked if I really did work in a lady's hairdressers, emphasizing the word ladies for maximum humiliation. And when I answered yes, she followed up by asking if I liked working there. And this forced me to think on my feet. I told her no, I didn't like working in the hairdressers and I was actually on my way to join the army the very next morning. Maureen seemed awfully impressed by this, which was fantastic in the short term, but I was also faced with a long-term problem of having to actually apply to keep my word. So that's how I joined the army, to impress a girl, assuming I could just leave if I didn't take to it. Only, I did take to it. Soldiering was bloody hard work, but I loved it, 
And I don't think I can really explain why outside of reeling off the usual cliches, but they're true. You make the best friends you ever have in your life, then you blow things up with them. As a teenage boy, what's not to love? I kept in touch with Maureen for a while after I was sent to live on base, but after a while, her life moved on and mine moved on too. Maureen moved on to some fancy university down in London, whereas I moved on to North Ireland. In the late summer of 1970, myself and the rest of Lancashire Regiment's 2nd Battalion were sent to Belfast, North Ireland's heavily divided capital city. For those that don't know, the mostly Catholic IRA were at the throats of rival Protestant paramilitaries, and the mistrust among civilians in both communities led to a very volatile kind of segregation. They didn't want to live together, but they also couldn't stop fighting. Our mission was to keep the two warring parties separate, but as time went on, we increasingly sided with Protestant paramilitaries since their loyalties lay with the UK. The whole thing was a bloody great mess, never should have happened in the first place, but we got sent there so we all just tried to make the best of it. Don't get shot, come home in one piece, and really nothing else mattered. We were billeted at a place called Girlwood Barracks, which was right next to Crumlin Road Prison. We used to joke about not being able to tell the difference between the two and how the food in Crumlin was probably better than the stuff we were getting. There was also very little for us to do at the barracks. It was great if you liked table football, pool, or reading, but, but anyone with a pulse was itching to get into Belfast city center whenever weekend passes were handed out, mainly so we could go down to the local pubs to relieve the stress of living and working in a bloody war zone. Only this war zone was unlike any other British forces have ever operated in. The older blokes in our company had served in places like Aden or Malaya, big open deserts or thick jungle, places you could use all your core soldiering skills. But there we were, operating in an actual city full of innocent people, and even more jarring was the fact that it was a city within our own national borders. Before I left, my mom and dad were telling me, look after yourself and all this other stuff, like I was headed halfway around the world. I remember telling them something like, I'll be fine, I'm not even leaving the bloody country. Now looking back on it, I can't believe I was so bloody naive, because although we were only across the Irish Sea and still technically in British territory, serving in Northern Ireland felt like we were a very long way from home. That kind of stress had younger lads like me longing for the comfort of the familiar, and to an Englishman, nothing is more familiar or more comforting than a good pub. I'm sure this is news to no one, but the Irish quite enjoy a little tipple, so the corn market area of the city center had one on almost every corner, really. And they were magnificent places, too, some of them almost a hundred years old, with intricate stained glass panels behind the bar. There were some good pubs back home, don't get me wrong, but the Irish took things up a gear when it came to proper community pubs. All you had to do was find one with Soldier's Welcome or We Serve Soldier sign and you were in for a ruddy good evening. I used to visit this one place quite regularly during my first tour and I got to know the landlady and the regulars quite well. But the real reason I used to frequent this particular pub so much when there were definitely places to get a better pint of beer was the pretty ginger girl who used to come in and talk to the soldiers sometimes. I heard her name was Roisin but I was far too shy to try and talk to her. Instead I just kept on darkening the pub doors and even if I had to go alone until she finally came over to chat with me. She was a few years older than I was, in her early 20s when I was still 18, but she was really easy to talk to. After a few hours of chatting, she gave her phone number and told me to give her a call whenever I intended to visit the pub. I ended up doing just that at one point and I invited her to join myself and a few of the lads in my section for a few drinks. And that's when she told me that, as much as she appreciated the invite, she'd rather see me alone. It was subtle, but I got the hint, and I just about skipped back to my billet after arranging to meet her another time. I had to wait a whole two weeks to be issued another weekend pass, but the moment I did, I telephoned Roisin. It was really nerve-wracking having her dad answer the phone, but when he realized I was the soldier she mentioned, cue the butterflies in my stomach, he grew very friendly, then handed the call over to her. We chatted for a few minutes. Then I told her that I was finally free to meet alone. She sounded very excited and her enthusiasm was very infectious. But after we arranged a date and time and I hung up the phone, 
Something just didn't sit right with me. Roisin had mentioned living alone in a flat above a shop, so why did her dad answer the phone? She later told me that he had been visiting at the time I called and had to answer the phone because Roisin was busy making their tea. It was a reasonable explanation, but it wasn't strictly necessary. I was so excited to see her for a date, as my kids would call it, but I didn't stop to consider that something might have been off. I didn't tell a soul about the meeting either. I didn't want anything to ruin my chances with Roisin, and as silly as that seems looking back on it, you might have noticed my habit of making silly decisions in the pursuit of romance. So, on the evening in question, I met up with her, and we had a lovely time, and when it came to about 9 o'clock, I offered to walk her back to her flat. It was only round the corner, so it wasn't like it was far, but when we got outside, she asked if I wanted to come inside to have another drink or two. It was like all my birthdays had come at once, and I'd never felt so high in all my young life. And I remember trying to keep cool as I said, yes, but I know I betrayed how thrilled I actually was. We went upstairs, had a few drinks, then when the right moment came, I moved in for my first ever kiss. I won't repulse you with all the gory details, but we ended up taking things to her bedroom, where more and more of our clothes came off until there was very little else to strip. Then, right before I thought the fireworks were about to commence, Roisin told me that she had to pop to the loo, then disappeared from the room to do God only knows what. I waited there for a few minutes, then the door opened just a crack and I heard Roisin tell me to close my eyes. I must have had the biggest grin on my face as I did so, assuming that I was going to be opening them to the sight of her standing in front of me, maybe even wearing some kind of racy lingerie or something. But as the seconds ticked by, I didn't hear a thing. No opening of the door, no footsteps on the carpet, no cheeky Belfast brogue telling me to open my eyes. Nothing but silence. Finally, I heard the door open, but instead of the gentle padding of bare female feet, the footsteps were much, much heavier. I remember this flash of fear going through me at the sound of those footsteps, and when I opened my eyes, that fear grew tenfold. I caught a glimpse of two men, both in balaclavas and dark green jackets, before the man in front of me punched me so hard that I fell off the bed. The next thing I know, they were forcing some kind of bag over my head, and before I had a chance to get it off, one of the blokes pinned me down while the other just started stamping on my head. I assumed that they were stamping on my head anyway. Whatever they were hitting me with was bloody hard and the next thing I remember, I wasn't being pinned down anymore and one guy was saying to the other, that's enough, he's out cold. Now I wasn't out cold, but I definitely wasn't in a position to defend myself and my one overriding thought was, this is it, I'm gonna die. They were obviously IRA men, or at least someone who had ill intentions for me, and they'd caught me half naked and very drunk with no means of defending myself. But then when the one bloke said, enough, I realized that they weren't going to kill me, not right away anyway. I have no idea what kind of hell they intended to put me through, but they still needed to get me from A to B first, and that gave me a chance to escape. At first, I stayed lying on the carpet on the side of the bed because I was physically and mentally in shock. But as the IRA men started talking back and forth with each other, I listened in and played dead, so to speak. Instead of keeping me prisoner in the flat, the men planned to move me to some other location. One was going to get the car ready, with the other telling him to bring it right up to the door of the house. While the other intended to tie my wrists and ankles before dragging me downstairs, that was their second big mistake. If they both focused on keeping control of me and tying me up, I might not have made it home. But working on the assumption that I was out for the count, they split up and gave me my opening. I waited until I heard the one bloke head downstairs and stayed still until the other bloke leaned down to start grabbing for my wrist to bind them. I stayed nice and floppy until just the right moment. Then I whipped the bag off and started to fight back. No, it might seem like a bit of a cliche, but my training really did just kick in and take over. All that hand-to-hand -hand training we'd done back home paid off big time, and I managed to get enough leverage to inflict some pretty nasty damage on the man's face by gouging his cheek and eye, just like our sergeant major had taught us to do back in training. The rest is a bit of a blur. 
but I do remember opening the bedroom window and shimmying out onto the lower roof just as the second IRA man came back upstairs to check on the first. I somehow managed to get down to ground level without breaking or spraining anything. Then when I realized it could still run, that's all I did until I reached a main road. Then it was only a matter of time until I reached a British checkpoint. Some military policemen, or red caps as we called them, the nicest name at that, drove me back to the barracks, assuming that I just had one heck of a wild night. When we arrived, I was then told to clean myself up, get some sleep, and to expect a disciplinary hearing in the morning. I was so glad to be back on safe ground that I just nodded, went to the shower block, then drifted off to sleep after the adrenaline crash. The next morning, I was told to report to my company sergeant major's office where the man himself was waiting for me, along with the MP who'd driven me back to the base. Again, I think they just expected me to shrug my shoulders and make some excuse as to why I ended up drunk and half naked in the corn market. But as I told them what actually happened, both of them had to pick their jaws up off the floor when I'd finished. I had some nasty bruising in my face to back up my story and I gave up so many intricate little details that they knew I couldn't have been making it up. The MP still double checked everything just in case I made up some elaborate lie but one phone call to the pub me and Roshin had been at and at least one major chunk of my story was confirmed. They basically let slip at my next hearing that they believed the rest of my story too and although they were well within their rights to send me to the glass house or army prison. I was going to be let off with a slap on the wrist on account of what I'd already suffered. I was confined to barracks for a while and the whole company got hit with a three week drinking ban which made everyone hate me for a while but I was alive. We started getting briefings telling us to be careful who we associated with, how the IRA had spies and hitmen out there just waiting to ambush us in our civvies. They hoped it wouldn't stop it happening again but young men remain young men no matter where they're from or what year it is. And a few years later, someone else fell for the same trick that I did and it actually cost them their lives. Not a single drop of alcohol passed my lips for the entire rest of my tour and whenever I got leave, I spent it in the gym or in the NAFI. After we got back, I spent another few more years in the services but I got out before they could send me back to North Ireland again. After that, I didn't tell anyone that story for 15 years not until I met my wife, and even then I waited until we were married. Mine isn't the kind of war story you tell in pubs so you can drink for free. Mine was something I was ashamed of. I was young and stupid, and had been easily tricked. But when all was said and done, and the thing that really hurt the most was that a pretty girl had made me feel handsome and interesting and funny. And it all was just some big lie. I was nearing the end of my first tour of Iraq, November 2006 to August 2007. It was July in an unfamiliar part of Diyala province, northwest of Muqtadiya. We were RVing with Iraqi police, with the majority of our platoon sitting idle in the surrounding area on our M1151s. In the distance we heard a few shots of small arms fire which our second lieutenant wanted to investigate. I was the driver to the second squad leader and Spartan too generally took the lead with us. Our platoon, which was undermanned, two squads instead of three or four, rolled out with two additional Iraqi army trucks and two Iraqi police trucks towards the suspicious gunfire. Outside the main village, there was an outcropping of buildings as if it was a mini village with one dirt and gravel road about a half mile long, with a drainage ditch on the left and canal on the right. This is where leadership failed on a few counts. First, air drone recon was called and responding, yet we did not wait for recon to proceed. Second, dirt gravel roads are avoided as much as possible because of the ease at which IEDs can be emplaced and hidden. Third, a secondary road was located but had clearly been intentionally blocked, making the main road in suspicious and even more dangerous. Lastly, upon proceeding down the road, the Iraqi police escort claimed that we were going into an Al-Qaeda stronghold and promptly abandoned the convoy, which was ultimately ignored by the 2LT. An Iraq Army Humvee took point next to my truck and another Iraqi truck, with the remaining seven U.S. trucks proceeding down this road. 
roughly halfway down, the lead truck stopped for some reason. Without radio contact, we had no idea why until I moved to the side a bit and saw a ditch across the road, bearing safe passage forward. My squad leader got out to get some word with the Iraqis ahead and immediately jumped back in a seat. At the same moment, we came under small arms fire. He jumped back in yelling about being shot at. Outside my driver's window, I saw three men pop up from tall grass about 15 meters directly beside my truck, firing AKs. My gunner called out a bongo truck to the front near the village with a mounted dushka, which is like a huge Russian version of a 50 cal. This was a typical L ambush, and I was front and center. No way forward, left, right, nor hasty retreat, taking small arms and now heavy machine gun fire. My gunner engaged the bongo truck, and I could see the M240 turret kick up dust around the three engaged on my left. I just sat there, unable to defend myself. Then came a bang, a flash of fire and smoke. I thought it was an IED. I felt a pinch on my left cheek and touched it, drawing back a heavily bloodied glove. I slapped it back on and applied pressure, training kicking in immediately. I called out to the squad leader, I'm bleeding, while I wondered if I was dying since I felt no pain. And unbeknownst to me at the time, the fire suppression system had activated which the heavy gas made our voices super low, like the opposite of helium. It was like a movie portrayal of slow motion, and my senses were all messed up. I had enough of sitting there in the kill zone and started to reverse. The Iraqi truck behind me didn't get the hint until I rammed him about two or three times. Finally, we began to back slowly away, which isn't easy on a narrow road, with one hand on the wheel with only a single side mirror no backup mirror and the passenger side mirror was blocked from view. At some point the medic had run up to my truck from about three back to jump in mine under fire. We managed to move the convoy far back enough that my squad leader could drive and the medic could tend to me. We eventually moved off the road and headed back to base while I sent up my own nine line media on the blue force tracker. After being seen by medics and being flown by Black Hawk to Ballad Medical, I learned that it wasn't hit by an IED. The Dushka had penetrated the armor of my truck above the windshield, ricocheting at the roll bar beside my head, finally breaking apart and spraying shrapnel across my face. A few inches and I could have had a stump where my head was. The PTSD is an SOB still to this day, and the VA says I'll most likely never be free of it. On September 2nd of 1944, as dawn broke over the Pacific Ocean, a group of U.S. Navy airmen serving aboard the USS San Jacinto climbed into their planes and took to the skies. They were based on one of the many American aircraft carriers which now dotted the Eastern Pacific, and their destination was the tiny island of Chichijima. Located around 500 miles from the Japanese mainland, Imperial forces had established a small naval base on Chichijima way back in 1914. But by September of 44, the island had become their primary communications hub for the entire Pacific theater. This meant the Japanese High Command saw fit to place a sizable garrison on Chichijima, and by the time of Pearl Harbor, around 4,000 Japanese soldiers and sailors called the island home. In addition, Chichijima's military garrison boasted a small seaplane base, a large communications array, and various gunboat, sub-chaser, and mine-sweeping units. The garrison also included a heavy artillery regiment, a formidable defense against American warships. So naturally, the U.S. Navy was only too keen to eliminate it. By June of 1944, the U.S. Navy had surrounded Chichijima, and a ferocious aerial bombardment commenced. U.S. warplanes of all shapes and sizes strafed and pummeled the island's beleaguered occupants on an almost daily basis. But the Japanese gave as good as they got. A sophisticated network of anti-aircraft batteries meant their attackers rarely departed unscathed, and the pilots that took off on the morning of September 2nd were acutely aware of the danger that faced them. Their target was Chichijima's radio tower, perhaps the most crucial of the entire Japanese war effort, but the defenders would not give it up easily. Approximately an hour into the mission, with heavy flak exploding in the air around them, a Navy pilot nicknamed Skin realized his plane had been hit. It was burning, Skin later recalled. The cockpit was beginning to fill up with smoke, 
I thought the plane was going to explode. Knowing that his deaths would be in vain if he didn't carry out his orders, Skin pushed his aircraft on towards the radio tower, striking it with two of his bombs before turning sharply away from the island. Skin wanted to get as far away from Chichijima as he could before ordering his crew to bail out. The longer he waited, the less likely they were to be captured. Finally, when it seemed as if though the aircraft might break apart at any moment, each man grabbed a parachute before leaping from the burning plane into the ocean below. Once Skin's parachute opened, he expected to see his comrades floating alongside him. Instead, he watched in horror as they flailed helplessly in the water below, all while Japanese interception boats raced towards their position. He knew they were doomed to be captured, yet he had no inkling of the horrific fate that would befall them. As Skin hit the water, the Japanese speedboats roared after him, and he had swam like hell to put some distance between them. I was crying, throwing up, and swimming like a maniac, Skin later recalled. I could have made the Olympics that day because we had to get out of there. Skin realized it was only a matter of time before the Japanese boats reached his position, yet to his relief, a small flight of American fighter planes appeared and swarmed his potential captors driving them off with a torrent of machine gun fire. The next moment, Skin was suddenly faced with the sight of a surfacing submarine. I saw this thing coming out of the water and I said to myself, geez, I hope it's one of ours, Skin later recalled. But his lucky streak had continued. The submarine was the USS Finback, and after he was pulled from the ocean, the exhausted pilot uttered just four words, happy to be aboard. Following his miraculous feat of survival, Skin would go on to become the 41st President of the United States, George H.W. Bush. Yet despite reaching the highest office in the land, Bush never forgot about the airmen who didn't make it home that day, not only for their sacrifice, but also due to the horrors they endured. Unlike the man himself, Bush's comrades were unable to evade capture. They were pulled out of the ocean by Japanese sailors, restrained then taken back to Chichijima to face their doom. These same airmen had been bombarding Chichijima for months by that point, so as you can imagine, not an ounce of mercy was shown to them. The Japanese were already infamous for their diabolical treatment of enemy prisoners, but even by their usual standards, the fate of Bush Sr.'s former comrades was beyond atrocious. To satisfy the bloodlust of the besieged Japanese servicemen, Two of the airmen were beheaded with a samurai sword just moments after stepping onto the dock. The remainder were taken to the garrison's detention center, where they were each subjected to horrifically painful methods of torture. Post-war records indicated that the Japanese were entirely uninterested in extracting any useful information from their captives, and merely used their torture as a means of avenging comrades slain by American bombs. One by one, the captured airmen were blindfolded led from the island's jail, then executed by a variety of grisly methods. The plane's radio operator was reportedly forced to dig his own grave before he was blindfolded and beheaded. The mechanic was stabbed to death over the course of hours, with his executioners using nothing but sharpened bamboo sticks as spears. Another was beaten to death with a wooden club, with his executioner careful to start with the man's legs so he'd feel every bone in his body breaking before the killer blow was finally delivered. What occurred that day is almost too terrifying to conceive, but the truth was, the horror had only just begun. By September of 1944, Chichijima had been under siege for months on end. A deadly combination of US submarines and airborne torpedo bombers resulted in less and less food making it to the island, meaning the Japanese garrison was on the verge of starvation. Once all the American prisoners had been executed, an aide to the island's commanding officer approached him with a suggestion. He explained that there was a way of conserving the energy required to bury the prisoners' corpses, while also recycling them to extend the garrison's food supply. The situation was by no means ideal, but it was also an extremely desperate one. So in a decision that was proved as methodical as it was cold, General Yoshio Tachibana ordered his men to commit cannibalism. The men of Chichijima's garrison were hardened veterans, each willing to obey any order given to them in service of their divine emperor. But when ordered to butcher, cook, and consume the corpses of their American prisoners, 
even the most fanatical of Japanese soldiers found themselves hesitating to comply. To persuade them, General Tachibana was forced to give a speech in which he urged them to show a fighting spirit, and once it became clear that no other supplies would be reaching the island, the garrison surgeons began the grisly task of dissecting the prisoners. Over the course of the following few hours, Japanese combat surgeons removed the liver and thigh muscles of the soldiers, which were then cooked and presented to the garrison's officers with a side of vegetables and soy sauce. At his trial for war crimes, Admiral Kinazomori later testified that a chef had the liver pierced with bamboo sticks before cooking it and was completely unapologetic as he explained that liver was a delicacy with powerful nutritional properties. Major Suyo Motoba, another of the officers who engaged in cannibalism, also defended his actions during his trial, claiming that these incidents occurred when Japan was meeting defeat after defeat. The personnel became excited, agitated, and seething with uncontrollable rage. We were hungry. I hardly know what happened after that. We really were not cannibals. Following the cessation of hostilities, the Japanese officers responsible for the Chichijima incident admitted to their heinous actions at war crime trials in Guam. At the time, the airmen that had been killed and consumed were officially listed as missing in action, and their families still prayed for their safe return. Till when it was confirmed that the missing had fallen victim to cannibalism, U.S. High Command was faced with a difficult choice. Tell the families the truth, and further traumatize them after a long and heart-wrenching absence, or conceal it and deny them closure. In the end, the relevant authorities opted to label the accounts of the men's final hours as top secret. The full story of what became known as the Chichijima incident remained a closely guarded secret until 2003, when author James Bradley published his book Flyboys, A True Story of Courage. George Bush Sr. himself was unaware of his comrade's fate, and was said to have been visibly shaken when he learned of the manner in which they died even if the news did come more than half a century after the fact. In an interview with news network CNN, conducted shortly after the news was made public, the former president shared his thoughts on the incident. Quote, I wonder if I could have done something different, he said before asking, why me? Why am I blessed? Why am I still alive? It's a question asked by many survivors of similarly horrific events, to wonder why they got to walk away from a tragedy when so many others did not.